For you who this is your first time to be here for the lectureship, of course, you can watch the first two sessions online, but let me give just a real brief bio um, on Dr. Anthony. For 27 years, Dr. Anthony held a faculty appointment at Talbot School of Theology, teaching courses in leadership, organizational development, and nonprofit management. During those years, he also served in a variety of administrative appointments, including department chair, associate provost, and vice provost. He now serves as a research professor of educational studies. He is also an adjunct faculty member at Denver Seminary, Capital Seminary, and we get the pleasure to have him teach here at Dallas Theological Seminary as well. Dr. Anthony has earned two doctorate degrees and has authored 13 books. He's been married for 30 years to his wife, Michelle, and they have two adult children. So please join me again in welcoming Dr. Anthony back to our stage. Thank you so very much. It's a joy to be with you. Day three, here we are. The heart of God and social engagement. I, I warned you a few days ago that I was going to meddle today. So the fact that you are here, be so prepared. <clears throat> now yesterday, for those of you who weren't here, we took some time to examine the heart of God in relationship to uh, specifically ministry leaders as we began with the call to conversion and for some that called into vocational service, we also took a glance at that, a glimpse of the, the paradoxical manner in which God trains and equips his saints for service, and the role that uh, sometimes pain and suffering takes as part of that preparation for training. Uh, I remember, I didn't mention this yesterday, I could go on with a, a, a very long litany of examples, but I remember when my wife and I lost our first child through miscarriage, how... Uh, what a, a very dark season of pain and suffering that was for us. And of course, I thought, how in the world could any kingdom purposes come out of something as, as horrible and tragic as that in our lives? And we were busy doing the work of God. We were both serving in churches and in, in, at a church and pastoral service while I was also uh, working full time at Talbot. And, and I just, I couldn't see it. I couldn't get it. It's in a deep fog of pain. And yet, years later, when one of my students had that same experience happen to him and his wife, I went over to their apartment, sat on the kitchen floor, and wept with this young man. Uh, words that I had to, to share with him came out of my own experience, and, and I trust were more meaningful because of the history of my own pain. And there have been so many examples like that, where I know that as hard and as painful at times as life can be because good things can happen to bad or bad things can happen to good people, that God can still bring about kingdom purposes out of that. And that's what I wanted to try to highlight yesterday is the role of pain and suffering in the life of ministry leaders can sometimes not be stumbling blocks, but can actually be stepping stones for a more enhanced form of ministry. That certainly was the case with uh, Corey Tenboom, uh, Johnny Erickson Tata, others, other contemporaries like that, uh, individuals that I've had the chance to, to hear in person. Uh, God uses pain and suffering in the lives of people and sometimes uses us along the way in that journey. So that was my uh, sort of wrap up yesterday. We also reiterated the fact that there is no template uh, there's no prescribed pattern that God uses in the manner in which he prepares and trains ministry leaders. Uh, it's, it's just in the sovereign will of God. Some were called with dramatic methods and others were not. Uh, we just have no prescriptive uh, means by which God chooses uh, his ministry leaders. You'll recall from Monday's first presentation that when we talk about the concept of God's heart, we're speaking of God's determined will and pleasure. I referenced Hans Wolf's excellent work, Anthology of the Old Testament, where in one chapter he summarizes 26 Old Testament references referring to God's heart. And he summarizes these passages in this sentence. They generally attest to his steadfast will and his longing desire, usually in regards to his plans for the future, for which his whole will is completely committed. In essence, when we talk about what is God's heart, once God is determined in his heart to do something, whether it's in the present or perhaps in the future, once God has purposed something in his will, that's it. It's set. Why God would change his mind? Why would he? 
because to do otherwise would to undermine the immutability of his character. Today we turn our attention to the heart of God as it pertains to the needs of the world. More specifically, those who are suffering, specifically from issues of injustice, from intolerance, discrimination, and prejudice. Now in some situations we're referring to those who are, as the Old Testament describes, sojourners in the land, while at other times we may be referencing those who are downtrodden, oppressed, disenfranchised, trafficked, and exploited. You'll note that I am not addressing the subject of social justice, Christian or otherwise, but rather social engagement. The former term has its origins in the writings of Plato in the Republic, a Socratic dialogue revolving around the nature of a just society. Indeed, many of our most conflicting and volatile political debates today such as same-sex marriage, health care, internet privacy, religious freedoms, immigration, redistribution of wealth, racism, and the like, center on disputes about the meaning of social justice. I prefer to focus less on the extremes of social justice as seen in the more contemporary disciplines of liberation theology, feminist theology, and theologies attentive to religious diversity, then focus more on what the text of Scripture has to say about how God expects us to respect and interact and treat others. To do this, I prefer a form of biblical theology of social engagement based on the more conservative foundation of exegesis rather than on the more easily distorted and biased methods of eisegesis. So let's talk a little bit about forming a theology of social engagement. As I approach my desire to form a biblical theology of wealth, poverty, justice, and oppression, I'm more acutely aware of my limited time, perhaps more than in any other presentation this week. For how is it possible to review and discuss the more than 2,000 verses in Scripture that speak on these topics? Throughout the Old Testament, we read of God's heart towards those who were oppressed, imprisoned, treated unfairly, homeless, those who are sex trafficked, those who are enslaved by economic systems that favor the rich over the poor. Let me read a sampling of some of these verses that speak of God's heart towards these people and, and what our response should be when we encounter them over the course of our days. I'll read them in the order that I find them. I won't give you all the references in order to save time, but trust me, I'm quoting accurately from the text. (laughs) We'll start in Exodus. Do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not degrade your daughter by making her a prostitute, or the land will turn to prostitution and will be filled with wickedness. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner, those who are are residing among you, for I am the Lord your God. If anyone is poor among you, your fellow Israelites, in any of the towns of the land that your God is giving you, do not be hardened or tight-fisted towards them. Follow justice and justice alone, so that you may live and possess the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Here's a great one. Do not take advantage of the hired worker who is poor and needy. Whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your towns, pay them their wages each day before sunset because they are poor and they're counting on it. Otherwise, they may cry to the Lord against you and you will be guilty of sin. Do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That's why I command you to do this. When you're harvesting in the field and you overlook a sheaf, don't go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the works of your hands. But you, God, see the troubles of the afflicted. You consider their grief 
and, the, and you take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. The Lord gives righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. For he will deliver the needy who will cry out, the afflicted who have no one else to give them hope. Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. I know that the Lord secures justice for the poor and upholds the cause of the needy. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them who have done this. The righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. Learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the cause of the widow. Woe to those of you who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees, to deprive the poor of their wages and their rights, and to withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. Woe to him who builds his palace by unrighteousness, his upper rooms by injustice, making his own people work for nothing, not paying them for their labor. Their labor. God defends the cause of the poor and the needy. And so all goes well. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord God? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does God, the Lord, require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against either of them. That's just a brief sampling. This is like, like, like a stone skipping across the pages of the Old Testament. I don't have the time to drill down on the thousands of verses, but I believe that's a, an accurate representation of God's heart. Now in the New Testament, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I needed clothing, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and your gifts to the poor. They have come up as a memorial offering before God. One would be hard pressed reading these verses and the countless hundreds others like them without coming to the conclusion that God's heart is acutely tender to the plight of those who find themselves oppressed, mistreated, hungry, imprisoned, poor, homeless, fatherless, immigrants in a foreign land, trafficked, and victims of unfair employment practices. God's heart, that is his steadfast will and his longing desire, is to see justice, mercy, and compassion, and peace prevail. Take a look at Jesus' mission statement. Let me read a verse of Scripture that I think is appropriate, that reveals his intention for being here as the Messiah. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was generally his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, 
to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. <clears throat> then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. <clears throat> I'm sure that was an understatement. He began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. <laughs> wow. This passage Jesus read was a messianic prophecy that envisioned a coming Messiah who would be both a servant to the needy and a king worthy of our obedience and devotion. As one of Jesus' first statements regarding his earthly mission and identity as the Messiah, what he said at this small synagogue nestled along the coastline of the Galilean Sea was a declaration to all those who were in attendance that he had come for a very specific prescribed mission. That mission statement of Jesus included recovery of sight to the blind. It's interesting to note that in the original text found in Isaiah 61, it also included a promise to bind up the brokenhearted. He continued by asserting his commitment to justice. He had come to proclaim freedom to those who had been imprisoned, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, no doubt this was an allusion to those who were living under the dictatorial reign of Rome. But perhaps in a broader sense, it also addressed those who had found themselves victim of a variety of injustices, whatever, whether they were political, social, or economic. This proclamation of the year of the Lord's favor was a clear reference to the Old Testament year of Jubilee, when slaves were to be set free, land was to be turned, returned to their ancestral owners, and debts were to be forgiven. The celebration, once every 70 years, was God's way of protecting against the rich getting too rich and the poor sinking too low into poverty. In their book entitled Kingdom Ethics, Following Jesus in Contemporary Context, the authors write regarding this passage that this justice and righteousness are what God desires. It's his will. More than that, they are what God does. What God does and acts and carries out as God delivers the oppressed from those who dominate them. In the reign of God passages especially, they are not merely human action, they are the gift of God's dynamic reign. And they write, they are the heart of what God does when God delivers, saves, ransoms, and redeems his people. Let's take a look briefly at Isaiah chapter 58. It's a beautiful picture of God's heart in relation to social engagement. Taken as a whole, the book of Isaiah addresses the exiled nation of Israel while they're held in Babylonian captivity during the 6th century BC. The Assyrians had violently conquered these people as God's punishment against their habitually idolatrous lifestyles. They had demonstrated centuries of contempt for God's law over a long succession of apostate kings. They were desperate in their attempts to gain back God's favor in the hope that maybe one day he would return them back to their land. Yet in spite of their efforts towards religious devotion, God judges them for their superficiality. God first passes judgment on their duplicity and then provides a glimpse into what he expects from them who desire to win his favor. The prophet interrupts their claims of piety by calling for a series of behaviors we recognize as themes throughout the prophets, to loosen the bonds of injustice, to share what we have with those who do not have, to bring the homeless into one's home, to give clothing and shelter to the naked, to reconcile with one's family, and to help the afflicted. These are more than just a one-time action. These are behaviors with broad social consequences, actions that will restructure relationships. God's desire is not for a single one-time act, but for a whole cloth dismantling of unjust relationships. 
Now, on the outside, they may have looked pious and godly, but God saw through their superficiality. God cares little for our rituals and our liturgies if they are not offered with a sincere heart. What what is shocking to us is the pronouncement in verse 4 that God refuses to listen to their prayers and their veneration of those who practice insincere religious activities. However, this passage provides clear direction of what does please God's heart. Verses 6 and 7. Is not this the kind of fasting that I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke? To set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, go clothe them, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Untying the cords of the yoke, literally in the Hebrew, to untie the thongs of the yoke, would have referred to the leather straps that fastened the yoke on the head of the oxen as they plowed. While the exact meaning of the prophet's statement may be susceptible to some debate among scholars, the more probable sense is that if they were exercising any unjust and any cruel authority over others, if they had bound them in any way that was contrary to the laws of God, then in the interest of justice they were to release them. This might refer to their compelling others to servitude that was more rigid than the law of Moses allowed or perhaps holding them to contracts which were fraudulently made, or to their exacting strict payments with persons wholly incapacitated in their ability to repay their obligations. Or might have referred to subjecting others to more rigid service than what was allowed by the laws of Moses. But it would not not require a very ardent imagination for anyone to see that if he or she had had been holding slaves, that this came fairly under the description of the prophet. Let them go. In short, if they wanted their prayers to be answered by God, and if there was to be any hope of national restoration, a public commitment to national justice would have to prevail. It would need to be sincere, comprehensive, and infused with wholehearted mercy compassion, tenderness. Anything less would be met by distance from God. That is sobering. Right now, how do we put this into contemporary perspective? How, How does it change the way that we live as contemporary believers in the church and as ministry leaders? So what's the average Christian sitting in a pew to do? If we know in in no uncertain terms that the heart of God is directed towards the plight of the poor, the hungry, the trafficked, the orphan, the widow, the unborn, the prosecuted, the imprisoned, the immigrant, this long litany and list that I've just read about. If we know that God's heart is attuned to them, what is our response? Does God expect anything of us as we read these passages? Is there a divine mandate that we join him in these concerns, in his quest for justice and for intervention in social engagement or other forms of intercession on behalf of those who are weak? Or is this just simply something that we read, give mild reflection to, and then go merrily on our way or achieving our own personal goals and objectives in life? Is this idea of social engagement If it were based upon one random verse, some abstract mystical parable or biblical concept, we might be able to get away with inactivity. But when we discover that these verses transcend the entire biblical narrative, it forces us to reconsider our own personal priorities. At least they should. But is it realistic? Come on, let's be honest. Is it realistic to believe that our engagement in the plight of the world can make a difference? In essence, does it really matter? Many who have read through these verses, for they are certainly not hidden from anyone who's read through the pages of Scripture, have come to the belief 
that since the world is going to burn up anyway, why bother? I grew up in the hippie generation, San Diego in the 60s, which subsequently transitioned into the Jesus movement. That was me, long hair, pot smoking, surfer on the beach. And then Jesus radically, radically transformed my life in the early 70s. We were raised on a steady diet of teaching about the rapture. It was coming any day. Books were written, the late great planet Earth for one. There's a new world coming. Oh, there's a long list of these books. Songs were written to remind us of the impending destruction of the world. Barry McGuire's The Eve of Destruction. Randy, was it Larry Norman's? I wish we'd all been ready. I could still sing that song. It has just been so ingrained in my, in my DNA. I'll, I'll spare you, but <laughs> you can look it up on, on YouTube. It's still there. I wish we'd all been ready. Two men walking up a hill, one disappears, the other standing still. One, one couple sleeping in bed, one disappears, the other's gone. I mean, this is frightening stuff. I mean, as youth pastors, we scared kids out of hell right there because of the rapture. It was, it was coming tonight. Youth rallies proclaim with urgency that we were on the brink of the end. So naturally, why invest in what may not be here tomorrow? Why feed a hungry child if they're going to die tomorrow anyway? Wasn't it more important to ensure their eternal home since they were so close to going there? It was for this reason that the evangelical church for so many subsequent decades placed greater emphasis on evangelism than on social engagement. Now, nearly 50 years later since I gave my life to Christ, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if we have somehow missed the message, misinterpreted the urgency, or at the very least, perhaps we're misguided in our passion and zeal is there not room for a more balanced perspective? Time certainly doesn't allow for an exhaustive exploration of each of these important issues, this long litany of people that God cares deeply for. But let's drill down on just one of them in the remaining few minutes that I have. Let's just take poverty, for example. That's a simple process to deal with, right? I deal with this issue every day as the chief operating and finance officer at the Dream Centers in Colorado Springs. In our city, I'm led to believe by the folks who are sitting on the city council that we have approximately 850 homeless families in our city. They have fled from their homes in most cases due to domestic violence. Imagine you're living in a small little vehicle, a little Toyota, and you've got two little children in the back seat sleeping in a sleeping bag together. Seven degrees outside, it's snowing, and you're in the parking lot of a local Walmart. At dawn, you need to get them fed, dressed, dropped off to school by eight o'clock in the morning. Everything your family owns is packed in this car with you. Life has not been fair. It has not been equitable, but nevertheless, here you are. Some of these ladies drop off their kids at Sunday school as they enter the church, and they pray for God's provision protection, and deliverance. Welcome to the world of urban poverty. This is my world. So how do we fix this? How is poverty solved? Not, not, not to mention all the others. Let's, let's just drill down on poverty. How is poverty solved? It's more than simply giving this woman and her children a place to sleep at night. Shelters have their place, but they don't solve the underlying issues that contribute to this woman's state of affairs. It's more than providing them with a meal to eat at night. A meal is helpful, but it doesn't solve the long-term problem that this family's facing. Commenting on this dilemma, Richard Stearns, president of World Vision USA, writes, meeting one need isn't enough. Shelter's a good thing, but having a new home doesn't necessarily put food on the table. Food security is crucial, but food without medical care is ins insufficient for good health. Access to health care is key, but without clean water and sanitation, people will continue to get sick. Water is foundational to life, but without schools and education or economic opportunities and access to capital, communities remain mired in poverty. It's complicated, folks. It's convoluted. So then if it is genuinely complicated and convoluted, 
do we do nothing? Are we to simply throw up our hands and say, this is too hard. Let someone else figure it out. Is that the response that God calls us? Is that the response God calls the church to? That certainly wasn't the attitude of the Jerusalem church or the early churches that also had poverty in their communities. For we read in Acts chapter 4, all the believers were of one heart and mind. No one felt that what he owned was his own. Everyone was sharing. And the apostles preached powerful sermons about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And there was warm fellowship among the believers and no poverty. For all who owned land and houses sold them and brought the money to the apostles and to give them to the needs of others. While there's any number of possible responses a Christian can make, probably the most common response, judging from what I see in the North American evangelical church, is to simply sit on your hands and do nothing. After all, getting involved in the needs of those who are dirty, hungry, or imprisoned in traffic, that's messy business. It's controversial. People may not like you. Deacons may not support you. It's not that today's average church-attending person doesn't care. I really believe they genuinely do. Just not enough to do anything significant about it. They may, have, uh, they may offer the occasional prayer to solving these social plights, but at the end of their day, their inactivity speaks loud and clear about their apathy. I suspect God hears it too, much like he did in the days of Isaiah. The founders of the liberation theology movement espouse another possible response, albeit a far more militant form, Founded in Latin America in the 1960s and 70s as a response to the widespread poverty and injustice found in Latin America, its leading proponents were Leonardo Boff of Brazil and Gustav Gartieres of Peru. The former was a Catholic theologian and friar of the Franciscan order, and the latter was a Peruvian philosopher and Catholic priest from the Dominican order. Both were instrumental in calling out the authoritative hierarchy of the Catholic Church and were highly criticized for those in, by those in economic and political power. Father Gertieris penned a groundbreaking book entitled A Theology of Liberation in 1973 that rocked the Catholic Church and espoused a radical model of socialism that was predicated upon the writings of Karl Marx. Liberation theologians sought to depose the ruling ex elite and fight for an economic, political, and spiritual liberation of socially oppressed peoples. In liberation theology, the lines between social engagement and political revolution are blurred. We see the remnants of this response in calls for a radical economic redistribution of wealth within our own American society today. Liberation theology goes wrong in a couple of places. For one, it places social action on equal footing with the gospel message. As important as feeding the hungry is, it, it cannot take the place of the gospel of Christ. Mankind's primary need is spiritual, not social. Also, the gospel is for all people, including the rich. Visitors to the, to the Christ child included both shepherds and wealthy magi. Both groups were welcome. To assign special status to any one group, preferring one over the other is to discriminate, something God does not do. Christ brings unity to his church, not division among socioeconomic, racial, or gender lines. Perhaps we'd all agree that having no response is unacceptable. And likewise, a radical and revolutionary response of liberation theology is not a credible alternative. How about we discuss the possibility of a more moderate and reasonable alternative? While running the risk of being somewhat overly simplistic, let me suggest that the answer is a reliance on the Holy Spirit. I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all response for the church today to meet the needs of poverty. Even Jesus said, you will always have the poor among you. There are simply too many variables involved in that war against a sustainable to provide a sustainable alternative. So I'd be naive to believe that the answer to the world's poor would be solved through the efforts of the government, federal social agencies, Wall Street tycoons, or even well-meaning contemporary entrepreneurs. The answer is to be found in the church. 
But how do we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit as he seeks to reveal the heart of the Heavenly Father, as it pertains to the needs of the poor? A corporate heart of humility and openness to respond in a meaningful way are two good first steps. Believing the words found in Psalm 19.17 is also helpful. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. Let me close in the last couple of minutes with a contemporary case study, one based on one local church as an option for you to consider. The year was 2006. New Life Church was being led by a highly charismatic and politically engaged Reverend Ted Haggard. He had once been hailed as one of the most up-and-coming evangelical leaders in America, but was harboring secret sins. Eventually they came out, and the church came crashing down. $26 million in debt. The nation was in the midst of a financial meltdown, and the church went looking for a new pastor. <laughs> no one in his right mind would have volunteered for such a post. It had to be a pretty dramatic call of God to go there. Enter Pastor Brady Boyd, age 40, currently serving as an associate pastor in a local church here in Dallas, Texas. He had never served as a senior pastor before. He started his commission from the Lord to serve as the senior pastor at New Life Church in August of 2007. Three months later, on December the 9th, a disturbed young man named Matthew Murray showed up on campus with a gun and took the lives of two sisters. In the blink of an eye, Stephanie and Rachel works. It should go without saying that the church was on the brink of folding. Attendance was down to 8,000. Some people believe it was cursed, while others believed it had no future. Mass exodus, extreme debt, moral failure, active shooter takes the life of two parishioners, what a way to start a pastoral ministry. That's all in his first hundred days. At the onset of Pastor Boyd's tenure at New Life, he read those poignant verses, those, those words from Proverbs 19. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward those for what they have done. Pastor Boyd had a passion for the needs of the poor in the community, but what about the church's need? They've been paying their 150 staff members with a line of credit. Was this any way to start giving to the poor? Wasn't the church itself poor? Pastor Brady believed God at his word and took a bold leap of faith. He expanded the church's local outreach ministry and formed the Dream Centers as a separate 501c3 nonprofit. Needless to say, not everyone was in favor of such a move. He started a medical clinic for the women in the city who had no medical insurance. Shortly thereafter, he raised $2 million and refurbished an apartment complex in a rundown part of town to house homeless and abused women and their children. Today, Mary's Home provides housing, trauma counseling, and college-level education to 12 ladies and 22 children, so when they graduate four years from starting the program, they'll enter a career that will garner a $40,000 a year career. During the same time the church has paid off half its debt, this past Easter, attendance was 22,000. Somehow, somehow the Holy Spirit spoke to this local church pastor who had the courage to do something quite counterintuitive and give to the poor. Not after the church had paid down its debt, not once attendance had picked up, not even after he had earned the trust of the congregation. This pastor acted out of a conviction that there are certain non-negotiable and irrevocable fundamentals for the church. One of those is social engagement with the points of pain in the city. The 21st century church is fixed on building bigger buildings, stages with dramatic lighting and sound, marketing themselves to every possible demographic. Now, please don't get me wrong. These are not necessarily bad in and of themselves. They just aren't the best kingdom activities. Let me be honest, I don't recommend this approach to everyone, especially to those of you who are perhaps in your first pastorate out of seminary. However, never underestimate what God can do through the life of someone whose heart is perfect towards him so that he can show his great support in the life of that ministry later. So let me conclude with the words of the psalmist in chapter 146, verses 7 and 9. 
Speaking of God, the psalmist writes, who executes justice to the oppressed, who gives food to the poor and the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are bowed down. The Lord protects the strangers, but he thwarts the way of the wicked. Scripture is replete with too many verses that speak of God's heart in relationship to social engagement. And it behooves us as ministry leaders through the leading and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to figure out the points of pain in the city where God plants us and to figure out a strategy for trying to make a difference in the lives of some. May God give you wisdom and discernment as you go forth from here. Let's pray with me. Father, thank you for just a brief glimpse into your word that reveals your heart of tender compassion and mercy towards those who are in such need. Father, I pray that you would help us. Help us to remember the words of Chief Justice Earl Warren, quoted by Martin Luther King in a jail cell in Birmingham. The justice too long delayed is justice denied. Father, give us wisdom and discernment as ministry leaders. Wherever it is you plant us, there will be poor. There will be those in need. There will be homeless. There will be immigrants. There will be those who are crying out to you. Father, allow us to have wisdom and courage. Having discern your heart's response to act, to do something in the name of Jesus. For it's his name we pray. Amen. Thank you so very much. Mm -hmm.